Oh, sorry. No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's good. And there is a, there is a speaker here, which, so Annette has organised that and Maggie, so that people can at least hear. And you can text me or I'll come out and ask, see if there's any questions. Thank you. Okay. Like the cat too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to wander back inside. See you in a minute. What's that? See you later. See you later, alligator. Hello from Jarrah People's Country. Well, do we have a story for you. But before we begin, please pause the video and take a moment to subscribe to our website. So if we are deplatformed here, you can find our work there. That is, if you're not already watching from there, head to artistsfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. We are not advancing all the following views expressed in this video. For example, we do not believe David Holmgren is collaborating with the far right, though he isn't a political exclusionist or a purist. Nor do we believe the neoliberal left cannot claim some responsibility for the growth of the far right. Binaries are going to binary like viruses are going to virus. Instead, we offer this video as a way of examining some of the politics existing both inside and outside the permaculture tent currently, at least in a small corner of unceded Australia. And we acknowledge that this piece only raises a few key topics of a complex many. This is more an examination of what happens when people take politics offline and go back into the community space face to face, albeit at a segregated event. We hope this gives you some insight wherever you find yourself across the diverse spectrum of COVID discourse. First off, we've got Cam Walker, um, who's going to speak to Terry's work. And as you know, many of you know, Cam is the campaigns coordinator um, of Friends of the Earth and lives here in Castlemaine. I may not say anything coherent, but I, I'll get the mic working. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think, so thank you. I want to say first thank you to Anitra for the amazing job of the sessions that are held here and have been held here and, and what a gift it is to our town to have these, to my mind, really convivial and really interesting gatherings to talk about interesting ideas. And I think Castlemaine is, is a richer place for it. So thank you very much, Anitra. Um, and I want to acknowledge the crew who are sitting outside, um, David and Sue and, and the other people. We live in a really, a really difficult time, you know. Um, so many of us spend so much time online yelling at each other in caps lock and the world is driven by disagreement and polarisation and we know that social media has driven that a lot. And uh, being in a room with people is always a bit different because it's easy to have Dutch courage at the keyboard and often we say things we wouldn't say to people's faces and I think that what we need is the ability to actually meet and greet and talk and see each other as humans. So I appreciate they're here and um, I hope that some of their, their you know, input will come into this and obviously particularly the work of David as, as one of the key people in, in, the, in the genesis of the, the concept of permaculture and, and long work um, of many decades in that space should be acknowledged. But also I just hope we can be kind to each other. You know, um, I am online exceptionally rude about what I call the cookers. So the people, uh, the sovereign citizen movement and um, the white supremacists and the Nazis um, and the fascists that are seeking to take control of the freedom movement and they should be denounced in the strongest possible terms. And we should not have any common cause with them and we need to oppose their influence because that influence is poisonous. Right-wing libertarianism you only have to look at the United States to see what a cancer it is on that society and we need to oppose it every step of the way. We ourselves became in the same way fascistic as the fascists were. We didn't realise that our enemies, our opponents are human beings. This is what is in the heart fascism the oppression of other meanings of the political opposition and uh, oppression means elimination. So in spite of that, I think what we need to do is amongst our comrades and our allies and amongst people in general is to be kind to each other and listen and park our thoughts and, 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 and seek to engage and hear other perspectives. So, you know, by talking, we bring ourselves together. 
or as online where we disagree and there are people we need to disagree with and mobilise against, that pushes us always towards polarisation and opposition. The, 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 the recent um, actions of David Holmgren, you know, in relationship to the pandemic, uh, ca cause a certain kind of problems in the movement. Basic, basically, because the movement is partly based on, upon a charismatic foundationalism, that, that, that it's, it's hard for members of the movement to, at the same time, talk about the, the guiding influence of David's books on, the, on, their, on their thinking, their permaculture thinking, and yet to massively disagree with him on, on either, either the topic of the pandemic or the topic of um, kind of being involved to, to an extent with the far right. So is David Holmgren involved with the far right? This seems like the same cancel culture takedown attempt on journalist Glenn Greenwald, who was recently subject to far right labelling on Wikipedia. Despite being just outside the door, David Holmgren was not asked about this. Um, so I, I, th I think that that's the current situation. It's very hard to know how permaculture people are going to move on this. In terms of permaculture as a social movement, a polycephalous, you know, like many headed social movement with autonomous parts networked together, it kind of doesn't matter. You can just go, well, th these books are really influential in my thinking, but at the same time, I, that doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with everything that's being said by, by David at the present time. And, and I'd also say that David, David doesn't actually, he doesn't, he, he, he makes it quite clear in his main blog post on this stuff that he doesn't aim to set the, the, uh, set up the whole thinking of the whole of the permaculture movement. He doesn't claim that he's doing that. He makes it quite clear he's not doing that. Um, and, and in a way, that dodges the issue, you know, because charismatic foundationalism is, is intrinsic to the movement. It, it, you can't get away from it. You know, if you don't have that, you have something else like agroecology plus degrowth or something. You have a different kind of movement. Um, and I, I just think, you know, it's a very much a watch this space at the moment. Um, so we'll see. In terms of the far right, uh, no, like it's it's a little bit unpredictable, I suppose. But but what I, what I think I think sort of like, like this is I don't know how this is going to come across. But in a way, the small the town market bioregionalism version and the critique of the state fits with fits with the, the sort of U.S. libertarian position to some extent. I mean, I think David's in a sense right to see a homology between these utopias. You know, both of them imagine that we can reform a market capitalist economy and make it virtuous and ethical. I mean, they've got a different idea of what that might mean. And, and, and both of them believe that the way to do that is to, is to localise it and, and avoid any kind of control by the state. And from the point of view, of like people like Cam, well, what he was just saying then, the problem with that is that we don't, we're not looking at what the state can actually do for us in the context of late capitalism. You know, we're ignoring that, 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 that huge issue. Um, but you can see why you can see in a sense why it, it doesn't make it, it's not it's not entirely unexpected to me that David's moving in that direction, and I and also think his thinking on the pandemic's influenced by a sort of rejection of high tech complexity because he believes that that cannot possibly work in in a, an economy without fossil fuels and this is based on Odom's writing which I think Odom writes a lot of rubbish in my view but it's like. You know, it's he's really important, and, and Mollison also cites him. So, so in some ways, I don't think what we're seeing is com completely unexpected. But it, and again, of course, it is, in a way, completely unexpected. What's what's the question? Can the left take any responsibility for the growth of the far right? Antifa. They 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 set themselves up absolutely anti-fascist, anti-fa. It's called antifa, um, and they're a far left group, if you like, and they have opposed themselves very much to the far right. So maybe not so much in Australia, but in other parts of the world, if there's a far right demo, the Antifa, which is the far left, will be there um, protesting against them. Unfortunately, um, pitch battles between the far right and far left don't really do anything to address some of the actual core issues. I'm talking about pitch battles on the street which is what it often becomes, or trolling or doxing, um, those kinds of online um, or something bombing. I can't remember what it is now. Anyway, doing mean things to other people online is a tactic of both Antifa and the far right. And so 
it's difficult to know if you fight fire with fire you get a particular result i know that's probably not what your question was in fact i couldn't hear you very well because of, i'm sitting there and you're behind the door so thank you <laughs> okay so what um we do at this point in Casmain free university format is um people can stay around have something to drink talk with people talk with our speakers um and enjoy the rest of the afternoon we're here at the Northern Arts Hotel in Castlemaine and we've just attended a couple of book launches uh, hosted by Castlemaine Free University. Um, the first book is The Politics of Permaculture and the second one is Young People and the Far Right. And uh, a number of us uh, weren't able to go inside, but the organisers put a speaker out the front for us and we inhabited the, the uh, the pavement out the front and we've been listening outside. It was very difficult to engage in the conversation, um, although I did get a question in um, from just outside the door. Um, so it, it, it kind of, one of the things that I find really amusing about this is that the, the latest science from Israel in the last week, the uh, head, one of the head immunologists that is advising the Israeli government has basically said with Omicron, there is uh, no difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. In Israel, we're, we were the first actually to immunize massively. And then we were confronted, we were the first to notice that there was a decrease in the, the waning of the immunity uh, following the second shot. And that's when we had to decide, and it wasn't, believe me, it wasn't an easy decision to decide that we need a third shot or a booster shot. And we did that. And then Omicron happened. We were surprised to discover at the end of the day that no, the vaccines are not protecting us, especially with the Omicron, where we don't see virtually any difference. You know, there's a very narrow gap between people vaccinated and non-vaccinated. Both can get infected with the virus more or less at the same pace. We don't want to eat this our presence here to be uh, a rupture or uh, a violence, but we have inhabited the space and we have engaged with people and broken down, I think, today some, uh, some uh, binaries. The, the fact that people are now out on the street speaking with one another, if we hadn't turned up today, if we had uh, if we had stayed at home because we weren't allowed to be here, these questions and these conversations wouldn't have come to the fore. And so we don't want to, this to be a shaming exercise, but we do want to stand in our place and, and to be here and outside of a building is quite symbolic. So um, particularly with David's work, um, because the politics of permaculture, of course, uh, where it's very ironic that we, that the, the, one of the co-originators of the permaculture concept, David Holmgren, cannot actually go inside the building. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it was a very interesting experience. I had a little bit of trepidation because both the uh, organiser uh, and uh, the host, the uh, owner of the, the venue, were uh, both uh, colleagues, uh, partners, going back sort of varying Yes, and so the navigation of that and the uh, still the hard line from at least uh, some perspectives around doing the government's bidding around something that, as Patrick says, is completely has no scientific basis. What do you, what do you think of the, the new rule to require vaccination of all NHS staff? I'm, I'm not happy about that. So. You're not happy about that, tell me. Uh, so I've had COVID at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got antibodies. Yeah. Um, I've been working on COVID ITU since the beginning. Yeah. I have not had a vaccination. I do not want to have a vaccination. Um, uh, the vaccine's reducing transmission only for about eight weeks yeah. with Delta. With Omicron, it's probably less. Yeah. And for that, I would be dismissed if I don't have a vaccine. It's not, the science isn't strong enough. But for the moment is the uh, ritual of uh, acceptance of authority and this uh, segregation. 
I mean, the ideas that were discussed, I mean, it was quite exhilarating for me to actually even hear from the outside, courtesy of the speaker that was put for, <laughs> for our benefit, uh, the ideas being articulated. I mean, the first book I was very familiar with, I'd been sent a, a PDF of it, uh, a proof PDF, and I actually uh, published a review of that book uh, myself some uh, months ago. But of course, this amazing crossover between the politics of permaculture and youth and the hard right were that, wait a minute, these are now almost one story as a result of exactly. the uh, interactions of the, the pandemic and this projection uh, that by our participation in marches ag against lockdowns, against mandates, uh, against permanent state of emergency laws. Boris Johnson claims to be a libertarian and when the COVID restrictions were first mooted, I asked him, I said, are you really going to push all this through and how long is it going to last? He said, you can trust me, I'm a libertarian. Well, he seems to be burying the libertarian bit at the moment. I voted against compulsory vaccinations for NHS staff and for COVID passports. My worry is that it leads us in the direction of identity cards and of formal identification of people for everything thing they want to do. This is the direction in which it goes. And strangely, the Tories are also proposing compulsory identification when you go to vote. And I think it leads us all back in that direction of a massive data bank of all of our information. And in the case of NHS staff being required to have vaccination, there are 65,000 staff not vaccinated, but do undertake tests and do work within the NHS. I don't think it's a good idea to lose that number of staff now when the NHS is under such huge pressure, not just from COVID, but from all the other problems people have, particularly during the winter time. Maybe yeah. there's an opportunity to reconsider with Omicron and the changing picture, or at least to nuance it and allow doctors who've had antibody exposure, who've got antibodies, yeah. who haven't had the vaccination, mm -hmm to not have it because the protection I've got from transmission is probably equivalent to someone who's vaccinated. Yeah, but at some point that will wane as well. But if you want to yeah. provide protection with a booster, yeah. you'd have to inject everybody every month. If it's worn off by two months, yeah? If, it's yeah. if the protection's yeah. worn off the transmission after two months, yeah. then after a month, you've still got a bit of protection. Yeah. So if you want to maintain protection, you're gonna need to boost all staff members every single month, which you're not going to do. The degree to which there's an emergency, it's actually created by the actions of government. So the action of standing in resistance to that um, whether that's at a, uh, in a sort of a large mass uh, solidarity gathering in some of the largest demonstrations in Australia's history, or whether it's in the intimate space of our own community, you know, with people we know, where that, uh, you know, that thing of, oh no, you, you are part of that other breaks down. And this is the joy of small rural communities, of course, and the constraints of them. Yeah. That and you can't yeah. just stand ideologically on your ground and say, those people or that idea is evil. Oh, it's the people we depend on for something else. Because, <laughs> because it's the neoliberal technologies that has enabled the psychopolitics of the algorithm and the polarization and the silos where the ideological war warfare is taking place in that psychopolitical space. And so when we come back onto the street and we meet with people who have, have, have arrived at a different place uh, in this pandemic, we can then start to have these conversations and take it away from the violence of uh, the algorithm and the violence of the, the psychopolitics or the behavioral insights units, teams that have really 
uh, captured many of us, and I think all of us have been captured uh, by some algorithm or another, but um, very rarely is that uh, addressed. But I, I want to bring um, something up with you, David, that we, uh, we discussed a little while, a moment ago um, about how your household and, and our household uh, well ahead, maybe two weeks ahead of the federal government actually putting in uh, proper uh, processes and proper to stop the spread. And like we were early adopters. We went into social uh, isolation very early. We took it very seriously because we were looking at all the countries that it was happening and going, why is our, why is the Australian government being so slow on this? And so even though it was foolish to ha like in hindsight to have that sort of uh, quarantine the, the, the nation and it, it prolonged the, um, the, the pandemic by uh, which the vaccines have done as, as well, all the psychological and physical suffering um, of the pandemic. But early on, we, we were very, you know, we, we were doing um, contract tracing. We were being very careful who was coming and we just thought it was irresponsible of our government to do that now at this sort of tail end of the of the pandemic um we're ahead again of the government <laughs> what is happening in israel the, the earliest mass vaccinated country we've been watching them for six months and con which has been confirming why our decision not to get this, these experimental inoculants that ha are not safe and effective, despite the propaganda from behavioural insights teams and governments. Are you now of the view that vaccine passports should be got rid of, phased out, because they're no longer relevant in the Omicron era? I, I yeah, I tend to think so. And uh, we know, even, even if the Omicron actually is causing a lot of uh, you know, breakthrough, uh, not breakthrough infection, but reinfections, you know, people that were vaccinated and, you know, secondary infections, et cetera, et cetera. We have to take into account that still the virus is better at immunizing than the vaccine. But... Sorry, that means, so you're referring to this natural immunity phenomenon, in other words. So to some extent, but that doesn't mean that I am encouraging people to go and get the disease in order no. to prevent from getting the disease. Mm. So maybe to speak a little about, you know, the trajectory of the pandemic and, and from that initial, you know, taking it very, very seriously to see, because you thought it, of it as a, another well, Spanish flu potentially. Well, certainly from my energy descent future scenarios work, pandemics was always biologically from a ecological point of view, a globally interconnected population of over 7 billion people is a perfect setup for new pandemics. Mm. So we were sort of expecting this at some stage. And when uh, things came out from Wuhan, the early, oh, is this maybe 1919 again? Or maybe it's the Black Death when a third of population estimate worldwide possibly died, certainly in Europe, in some places more than a third. And I, I had the view that despite our technology, despite all of our science, actually modern industrial globally connected society was so incredibly vulnerable, it could potentially even fall over and collapse from something as limited as uh, the Spanish flu pandemic. So we were taking that very seriously, both in terms of a survival sense and being able to support how whatever support we can give in society. Because we had, of course, very little trust in our institutions. Yeah, yeah. That permaculture was predicated on scepticism about institutions, scepticism about whether the whole model of industrial society had any long-term future. And of course, my future scenarios work has actually described what we are now in. And that work was more than a decade ago. So my interest in tracking that, I wrote three essays in 2020, um, thinking through those, those issues, but being quietly distilling. And then there was the time of, that led to pandemic brooding, which was a year. And then I put all the cards on the table and that involved basically saying, I don't believe actually any of the narrative. Almost all of it is a fabrication, a distortion, whatever else it is, 
you know, this is not actually what's going on. And I thought the proverbial shit would hit the fan because I knew that even within permaculture movements, there was this great uh, differences of view about this. That, and that like every other sector of society, permaculture networks had been sort of like cleaved off where some minority of some proportion had been sort of further alienated outside the system and some perhaps majority had gathered back within it for safety or for whatever perception. Uh, and that then that didn't even do anything because it was just a, an essay published on our website. And of course, the dynamic of social media, that it was a photo of us at a march, which triggered this, you know, um, Holmgren is a, is a far right fascist or marching with uh, neo-Nazis. So of course that is a series of things that have been building for some time. First, um, I would see what is now called woke identity um, politics ideology, which is, I've been watching build over a decade and been very skeptical uh, of. Dear Dr. Helen Wilson, <laughs> I have now closely considered the revisions of your manuscript, Dog Park, and, re <laughs> and will recommend its publication in Gender, Place, and Culture. You have done very good work to address the issues your viewers raised and have clarified your arguments. Thank you for your contribution to Gender, Place, and Culture, and I hope to be seeing your manuscript in print. Yours truly. PhD managing editor. <laughs> we have an accepted paper in the number one feminist geography journal. Since approximately June of 2017, I, along with two other concerned academics, Peter Bergoshin and Helen Pluckrose, have been writing intentionally broken academic papers and submitting them to highly respected journals in fields that study gender, race, sexuality, and similar topics. We did this to expose a political corruption that's taken hold of the university. By this point, several of these papers have been accepted in highly respected journals, and one that claims that dog humping incidents can be taken as evidence of rape culture has been officially honored as excellent scholarship. And then the intensification of social media that breeds angst and aggression, and then a massive propaganda push coordinated from the top, like nothing that has occurred in my lifetime or perhaps even in my parents' lifetime when they were active members of the Communist Party in the 1930s and 40s, or even yeah, really during the wars. This coordinated mass story from every source with no possibility of debate. If you are anti-mandate, you are absolutely anti-vax. I don't care what your personal vaccination status is. If you support, champion, give a green light, give comfort to, support anybody who argues against the vaccine, you are an anti-vaxxer. They're killing people. I mean, it really, they really, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. And I wouldn't want the, the appalling, the disgusting, and the potentially criminal behaviour of a small number of people to detract away from the amazing job that so many Victorians have done. It is so unfair for a small, ugly mob to be taking attention away from the more than 90% of Victorians who have had a first dose and will soon have had a second dose. So you basically said this is going to be like, well, it's almost like, I, you probably don't see it like this, the two different classes of people, if you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, you have all these rights. If you are vaccinated... That is what it is, so, yep, yep. And I don't think that ordinary, hard-working, uh, mainstream Victorians, those who are not ugly extremists, it's not reflective of what the vast, vast, more than nine in ten Victorians have done an amazing thing. So when you bring all those things together, combined with the natural animal instinct fear of danger and our society's absolute paranoia about death that 
this is yeah. something we actually yeah. can't deal with in affluent, long affluent, yeah. multi-generational society. We've never seen it, it's separated from us, and we've become like generally available for manipulation. So that standing up, and for me, it felt like this rising of the upbringing of my radical uh, left resistance politics, mm. which I set aside for the purposes of permaculture, we're gonna create the world we do want. But I always knew there's these lines in the sand where at some point you must say, no, you will actually, resistance is important, even if it's only symbolic. So for me, that, that was really that uh, point. But I think I also need to say that it's not this enormous anger I have about what's been done. Because from the larger energy descent, climate emergency crisis, this is just small stuff. Even though most of it is unnecessary, it's a sort of like a, a, a trial run for getting used to a different world. That, that makes... Um maybe a segue to uh, some of the threads in the left that I've been hearing through, through friends who are speaking about the pandemic as a possible blueprint for how we are going to attend to climate change by using uh, extremely authoritarian measures. That coming from left threads is really disconcerting con considering how much uh, abuse of rights across the board, particularly with indigenous Australians. This morning I went to my gym, I went next door to the coffee shop and the young lady there was so rude about me not being vaccinated, me not wearing a mask. And as an Aboriginal man, you're already 10 steps behind. You're already being frowned upon and, and, and um, you know, um, looked down your nose upon. So you're already beyond the eight ball. All of a sudden the added, the added burden and the added issue of the jabby jabby and you know the sicky sick and all this shit has given them even more entitlement so white entitlement in this country it's just a sickness and it's disgusting you give any white person any average white person in the street a little bit of power just that little tiny minute bit they fucking amplify that shit by 10 um, but abuse of rights uh, uh, throughout the world that has ha happened uh, be, uh, throughout this pandemic. Yeah, so that, that is something that is, I think, awakening in the left that is very alarming, that many in the left do not even see that there's a problem but in the one Democratic... Of, one of the points I thought that was very exciting here is Cam Walk uh, in, in responding to question about the responsibility of the left actually said that that idea of the climate emergency being a national security issue and the need for hard top-down things was a very dangerous approach because that is a point of connection that we need that discussion with Cam around, okay, we agree totally and the pandemic or the, the virus and the responses to it are the system learning how to do that how to have that hard response, and that will then draw in a proportion of the climate warriors who say, yes, the emergency is really big and serious, which it is, therefore we give up our freedom, we give up our autonomy, and we police the population who are reluctant to initially get out of their cars or do whatever is needed. And so, of course, radical change is necessary, but the resorting to, yes, centralised command economy. And this is the, is the, the idiocy solution. of it, because, because that state violence is so problematic, whereas uh, what our households have been doing is actually limiting, uh, you know, us going without cars, you hardly using cars, being really dependent on walked for food uh, and bicycle for food relations and energy relations, um, really walking towards uh, that connection to that small loved plot of land that Wendell Berry talks about and of course indigenous eldership talks about being part of country, be, being custodians of country and just 
that where where the role for government is to actually support that transition, not be violently authoritarian and taking rights away from people when they're not ready for it, because that is just going to lead to polarization and violence. So, so to look at households like ours and to say, these, these are, we are actually living one planet li uh, livelihoods or, or life ways. Um, this is a model. It's not the only model. These are responses. It's not saying people should live like us, but what is working and how can governments support that slow and gracious transition to a degrowth society. That that seems to be and the we've only had the elements of support at local government level with our retro suburbia strategy. That this is actually ways, even though they seem like radical, deep green, you know, maybe at the level of your household and ours, but in framing that through retro suburbia, we were seeing that this is not a sort of a green or even politically correct agenda for how we deal with you know, reducing our ecological footprint. No, this is actually a way of how to live better, re-inhabit the spaces we already occupy. And what we saw with Retro Suburb, there was this huge interest, like any uh, book that has a sort of a, uh, something behind it, um, as it was initially released in 2018, and then a second huge wave of interest when the first lockdowns as people were back in their homes. This enormous potential to rekindle the household and community non-monetary economies. And then what I saw in the marches was people who weren't necessarily motivated by how do we save the planet or even believing in climate change, this potential of a third great wave of people going, oh, if my job is that so insecure, oh, oh, we need to do our own due diligence and we need to have some sort of enlightened self-interest about what we do next. So we were at that march also as a research thing, handing out retro suburbia bookmarks. Two got, Sue got two knockbacks, I got three in handing out hundreds of bookmarks and people saying, Oh yes, something positive. So, but of course, in doing guess, that- Can I just interrupt? That's what I found with last year, with the first year of the pandemic. There was so much interest in your work and our work and permaculture in general across the board. People were at home, they had time on their hands for the first time and they were wanting to grow a garden and how, how exciting that was. And then the vaccine issues split us, split absolutely ruined that. Um, that moment because there was this, oh God, a big tech, quick fix. Um, doesn't matter that it's, it's, you know, technology from known corporate criminals. It doesn't matter about their track records. You know, some scientists are saying this is right. The government's saying it's safe and effective. Let's just go there and almost dropped the whole, you know, all the veggies went to seed and you know, <laughs> you know the weeds came in and so you know so that moment was was really gareth devonish said is this all it took to split the radical yeah. green left <laughs> and so that whole journey of those shattered networks is also two imperatives that i see one is the careful rebuilding of connections across this widening gulf which is based on different perceptions of reality and being in different spaces and having different possibilities in the wider society. And at the same time, solidarity connections with people who you don't necessarily have a lot of ideological in common, but they've just lost their job after you know 30 years as a nurse or their children can't go to school anymore. And the huge opportunities to build the parallel economy. And, and so rather than those being two opposites, we need to maintain the connection with the people still in the system, but this gradual re-emergence of solidarity where people are saying, yes, I'm vaxxed or whatever. Yes, I have these rights but I can see the writing on the wall of where this is going and that we reconsolidate those who have the capacities 
with new blood into building a parallel economy as fast as possible because the pandemic is really just the first of these great energy descent crises. And whether the next one is a war with Russia or whether it's the global financial system disappearing and uh, whatever those things are, both fabricated, uh, partly self-organising and also forces that we can't control. In the end, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether there's sort of evil group, so-called evil groups directing that. We can act in the same way that our ancestors have had to act in the past. There are always the fickle gods or the effects of things that one can't control, but we can control what we do ourselves. And building that parallel economy with our own resources is a huge opportunity. Yeah. And, and that move from ideas of self-sufficiency, which are really quite centred in, in the right, in right politics, to community sufficiency, which is really what retro suburbia is about. It's certainly what um, neo-peasantry is about. Permaculture came out of that creativity at the edge and its greatest creativity continues to live at that edge. And we've certainly been on the edge today, <laughs> out on the footpath, um, <laughs> not allowed into, uh, into the venue today. Um, but we are nevertheless grateful that the organisers uh, put a speaker out for us and many of the punters engaged and uh, really, yeah, work towards um, healing this rift that has been created. Well, that's the story for the week. A big thanks to Miles from Ideas Agency in Castlemaine for documenting this event. We'll be sharing any financial support we receive over the coming weeks with Miles. To support our work, please head to artistersfamily.is and click on the support tab. Thank you to those who have already contributed and thank you to those who are engaging with our work in respectful and generative ways. See you next week.